All right, now I got everybody's attention, right? You know, a couch is a uh, is an interesting piece of furniture. Make sure it's on here all the way. Don't need to end up on YouTube for that reason. <laughs> uh, like I said, you know, a couch is an interesting piece of furniture because you might sit on it in a different way, and it can be very personal on how you sit on a couch. And I know this seems odd for you, for this, you know, you're probably thinking, what are you even talking about sitting on a couch? Um, but think of it for a moment on how you sit on your own couch at your own house. Now, some of you might, you know, you think like, how do I sit on a couch? Well, Mike, I just sit on it like this. You know, I sit down. But, but most of us probably, when you sit on a couch, I mean, you sit, you sit more like this. I mean, you kind of lounge a little. You lean back. You get comfortable. You might even put your knee up a little bit. You know, you get comfortable. That's the idea of a couch, is to get comfortable, to make yourself comfortable. Now, it depends, though, on the location, the, where you're at on how you sit on a couch, and kind of what's going on. And so we call that the situation. It depends on the situation on how you sit on a couch at your own house and at someone else's house as well. Now, at our house, if it's just me and Jessica in our living room and we're watching, you know, maybe Netflix on the TV, and if one of us is on the couch, we're going to sit more like this, right? Yeah, I'm getting some head nods. You know what I'm talking about. And so, you know, we, we lay back, we lie down. And if one of us is taking a nap, you know, we might even lie like this or whatever. And when people come over, we, you know, we tell people, you know, make yourselves comfortable on our couch. We want people to feel comfortable at our house because we like to feel comfortable at our own house. And so, you know, when we're watching a movie, we might sit like that. Now, if people come over to our house and it, there's a group of people, you know, you're not going to lay out on the couch because no one else can sit on the couch. But you might still, you know, kind of lounge a little bit. You lean back, you get comfortable, you might put your knee up. If an ottoman is in front of you, you know, might put your feet up a little bit. But if you're there at your house and maybe you are talking to a child, maybe they've gotten in trouble or something, how you sit on a couch changes. If you're visiting someone, maybe you're visiting someone after the loss of a loved one, how you sit on a couch changes. You're not going to certainly put your feet up. You're not, probably most likely not going to lounge, but instead you're going to sit more like this. You might put your arms or your elbows on your knees. You're going to lean forward because it's going to be a very intimate situation. It's a very serious moment on how you sit on that couch. And so the situation dictates normally how you sit on a couch. And so what does that have to do with today? Well, today we're going to actually look at a verse that talks about how people are sitting on a particular couch in a particular situation. And so we're going to begin in the book of Amos. Uh, don't go there yet because we're actually going to look at 2 Kings, but we're going to talk about Amos first. And so you're going to be going to 2 Kings 14, actually. But Amos is an 8th century prophet to the nation of Israel. And a prophet means he brings a message from God to the people of God. That's the purpose of a prophet is to bring a specific message to a group of people. And Amos is 8th century B.C. and like I said, to Israel. Now Israel, if you know anything about Israel's history, you know that at one point they were a united kingdom and we call them Israel. But then they become a divided kingdom. And you have Israel or North Israel... And then in the south, you have Judah. And so when we talk about Amos being a prophet to Israel, we're talking about he's a prophet to north Israel. All right? And so Amos begins his message by listing out seven different nations and, and their sins and how God is, is angry with them for their sins and, and how he's going to punish them because of their sins. And of those seven nations, not a single one of them is North Israel. 
Of those seven nations he mentions, not a single one is North Israel. And so Israel, as they're listening in to Amos say this about all these other nations, they begin to feel pretty good about themselves. They're thinking, oh, he hasn't mentioned us, so we must be feeling pretty good. God must be happy with us because he's mentioned all these other nations except us. And so he lists all these other nations, and, and Israel's feeling pretty good. And there was actually reason, sort of, for them to feel pretty good. And so 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. Jeroboam was the king of north Israel, or Israel at this time. And so it says, he, or Jeroboam, was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. The Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. As for the other events of Jeroboam's reign, all he did and his military achievements, including how he recovered for Israel both Damascus and Hamath, which had belonged to Judah, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? And so Jeroboam is king of Israel when Amos brings this message. Jeroboam is king of north Israel during uh, the time of Amos. And good things had appeared to be happening for north Israel. I mean, their boundaries were uh, restored. They've kind of expanded. You know, politically, things were looking pretty good for North Israel. He's expanded their boundaries. Things were looking good economically. Things were going good for Israel or North Israel. So they kind of had reason to feel like, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty good. Like, things are all right with us. But the problem is that even though things looked good politically, they were not good spiritually, for North Israel. Rewind back a little bit in 2 Kings 14 to verse 23. Kind of get the whole story of Jeroboam. It says, In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned forty-one years. He did evil, in the eyes of the Lord, and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. And so Jeroboam, we find out, was not a good king, actually. He was an evil, wicked king for North Israel. And so even though things seemed like they were going well for North Israel, even though things, you know, might have looked like they were going well, we see here that they were not doing what God wanted them to do. And so Amos has listed seven other nations that will be punished by God for their sin. And then Amos is about to drop a bombshell, so to speak. You know, seven is like this number of perfect completion. It's kind of like, and now he's adding an eighth nation. So it's kind of like if you were to do a three-point sermon, right? We all know the classic three-point sermon. And then you throw in a fourth to really just throw a wrench in the system, right? Right? to kind of kick up some dust or to really get people's attention. So he throws in this eighth nation, and it's North Israel. And so Amos then lists out their transgressions and lists how God is going to go about punishing them. In fact, all the rest of Amos from then on is all about North Israel's sin. It's all about their sin and how God is going to punish them. And so let's go to Amos chapter 6 and kind of see what some of Amos' message is to North Israel. Chapter 6, verse 1, it starts off, Woe to you. Now this word woe is not like, Whoa, that's cool. It's woe as in cursed are you. Punishment is going to come your way. God is not happy with you. So he says, woe to you who are complacent in Zion and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. 
you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. So it says, woe to you who are complacent. Some translations say, woe to you who are at ease. You know, you get this idea of, of being, being stagnant or complacent and ease, that, that life is good, life is comfortable. You know, our, our bodies want to live a comfortable life. We want to be comfortable in our lives. We want to have a good life. But it's not just that they were living a comfortable life, so to speak. It's that they were lazy in their relationship with God. They were living kind of a carefree life when it came to their sin. They, they weren't concerned with their sin and, and how it separated them from God. And they weren't really concerned with, with repenting or, or turning back to God and leaving their life of sin. And we could go back and look at all their sins of, of worshiping other gods and worshiping other gods, you know, the way that God wanted them to worship Him. And so that they're, they're kind of mixing all these religions and taking advantage of the poor and the weak and all these different things. But what we're looking at today is this idea just simply that they were complacent. That they were content to just chill and live out life. One translation reads in Amos chapter 6, verse 1, it says, What sorrow awaits you who lounge in luxury? What sorrow awaits you who lounge in luxury? They were lounging. They were not doing anything worth value. They were just kind of sitting there getting comfortable, not really doing anything of any value. They were lounging, he says. Continuing on in verse 2, it says, Go to Kalna and look at it. Go from there to Great Hamath and then go down to Gath and Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? You put off the day of disaster and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. Amos is speaking to the people of Israel, and, they see, and we see that they would much rather be living it up. They would much rather be living it up. They'd much rather be lounging on their couches and feasting. It says that they're drinking wine, not just by the cup, but by the bowlful. And so Amos warns them that because of this attitude, they will be among the first to be exiled. And God has a very specific message to them in verse 8. It says the sovereign Lord, which there's weight in that, that sovereign Lord. It's not just the Lord, but sovereign Lord, the one with the most power and authority, has sworn by himself. The Lord God Almighty declares, I abhor the pride of Jacob and detest his fortresses. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. He says he abhors the pride of Jacob. This idea of not just he's angry with them or upset, but it's this idea of like, you know when you eat some food, and I mean it is just awful. I mean you can't even bear to choke it down. You can't even bear to have it in your mouth one minute and so you just spit it out instantly. That's kind of the language here that God says, I am so fed up with you Israel that I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Now, our life may not be exactly like Israel. We're probably not committing the same sins that North Israel committed. We probably, I would venture to guess, don't even have that same kind of attitude. But I wonder, how many times do we find ourselves 
lounging on couches. I think, oh, you know, I, I really, I, I, I don't really want to do that, so I'm just going to, going to sit right here. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I've, I've been working really hard, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to take it easy for a little bit. Or, or my time has passed, so I'm just, I'm just going to take it easy for a little bit. Just lie here. Get comfortable. Lounge a little. And so what we find is that we are actually the ones, we too are lounging on couches. Maybe, maybe it's a spiritual couch we're lounging on, so to speak. But maybe it's also a physical couch we're lounging on and we need to actually get up. We're going to break away from Amos for a little bit. And I want us to look at one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Now, this story is not one that you normally hear at VBS. It's not one that, you know, it's not one of the classics, so to speak, that we think of. But it fits perfectly with what we're talking about this morning. It's in Isaiah. You can be turning to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah was also a prophet, just like Amos. And in fact, he was a prophet during the same time as Amos. As Amos was speaking to North Israel, or, or what we call Israel... Isaiah is speaking to Judah, or South Israel. And we're actually not going to look at so much Isaiah's message to Judah, but instead we're going to look at his calling. And if you know anything about when God calls people, a lot of times they would try to come up with excuses. They would say, oh God, you don't really want me, do you? I'm not, I'm not good at that. You need, you need to find someone who's better at that. Or you need to find someone else. God, not me. So I want us to look at Isaiah's calling in chapter 6, verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, this is Isaiah speaking, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. So Isaiah is sharing this vision he has where he sees the Lord Almighty. And it says the train of his robe fills the temple just to show his greatness and glory. And you've got these seraphim with six wings and they're in God's presence and God is so holy that they have to cover themselves from God and they are shouting, holy, holy, that, that God is so holy. And so Isaiah sees this vision, and his response is, is understandable. He says, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. You know, he says at first, Who, who am I to see the Lord Almighty? I'm unworthy to see this. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, with it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Isaiah said he wasn't clean, and so God steps in and makes him clean, which is certainly a, I mean, there's a lot that we could spend time talking about that, how, how Isaiah thought he was unworthy, but God steps in and says, No, I make you clean. But I want you to notice this next verse, because this is my favorite verse. You see, God calls, speaks out, and says, Who will go for me? To who shall I send? You got Isaiah there thinking, Oh, God, you want me to go? Really? You want me? Like, I, I just sat down. I just got comfortable I've been doing all this other stuff, God. Well, 
you know, if, if I really have to, really, are you sure? Are you, are you sure? Like, no, no, you don't get that at all when you look at it. It says, verse 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. You know, I get this image that, you know, that if Isaiah was even sitting down, when God says, who will go for it? I imagine jumping right up and saying, send me. Here am I. Send me. You know, I, I, I envision it kind of like, you know when you're in class and a teacher asks a question and there's a kid who knows the answer? They raise their hand and they stretch it as high as they can because they want to get noticed by the teacher. They might even wave it around a little. They say, oh, pick me, pick me, pick me. I, I kind of imagine Isaiah being like that. Where he's saying, pick me, God. I will go. I'll go for you. Pick me. Don't you see my hand? And the truth is, we need a lot more of this in our church. We need a lot more of this coming from adults. We need a lot more of this coming from teens. We need a lot more of this coming from kids. You know, lounging is nice. It's comfortable. It's easy. But nowhere does God call us to be comfortable in our faith. Jesus calls his disciples and, and us as well to pick up and carry their cross. There is no lounging when you are carrying a cross. I'll say that again. There is no lounging when you are carrying a cross. You are either lounging or you're carrying a cross. If you are going to lounge, you have to literally take the cross off, set it down, and then lounge. You cannot lounge when you are carrying a cross. It's comfortable to sit on a couch. It's easy. God, you, you want me to, to teach a Bible class? You want me to be a teacher at church? That's kind of uncomfortable for me. No, I'm good. You, you want me to introduce myself to a visitor? No, that, that, that's uncomfortable, God. You want me to go visit the shut-ins at our congregation? No, that's, un that's uncomfortable. You, you want me to invite my neighbor over and tell them about my faith in my church? No, that, that's, that's uncomfortable. I'll just, I'll just sit right here. God calls us to stop lounging in our faith. And you know what the, the beauty is when you stop lounging on a couch? When you go from lounging on a couch to sitting like this, you make room for other people. You make room for other people to sit on that couch with you. You make room for that person who might be hurting who's going through a difficult spot in their marriage or, or, or going through some questions with their faith. You make room for some teens who you're now teaching a Bible class for. You make room for people to join in life, to share in life together. You make room for maybe a neighbor to come over for a cup of coffee to talk about your faith with them. There's nothing wrong with couches. In fact, I would even venture to say we need couches in our life. Because it's on couches that ministry is done. It's just we can't hog the couch and expect ministry to be done. And so the invitation isn't really so much to get up off the couch. 
Don't get me wrong, there are times where we need to get off the physical couch. In fact, that's what it is. It's to get off your own couch, perhaps physically. But the invitation is to make room for that metaphorical couch. Stop lounging on that couch and make room for someone else to join you. And then for you to figure out who that individual is. Here in a moment, we're going to stand and sing a song of of encouragement. If we can encourage you in any way, if we can help you to maybe, you know, get off that couch or to stop lounging on that couch, if we can help you figure out who it is that you need to invite onto your couch, we want to help you with that. Or maybe, maybe you just need to find a couch to sit on. Maybe life has gotten difficult for you and we can encourage you in any way. Please come now as we stand and sing.